Well, gratitude. Uh, you should have seen on our sign this statement, when gratitude becomes your default setting, life changes. And you may say, is that really true? You may say, is that true? Does your life change? If, if, you know, if you show gratitude, does your life change? Is that something that, that is, is truthful? Um, so it's, it's one of those things that God calls us to do. He calls us to be thankful. He calls us to show gratitude. And so um, as we go through the scriptures this morning, I'd just like you to consider and think about the idea of gratitude. Now, the story I'm going to read is a story that we're all familiar with. We've all probably heard it. Uh, it's where Jesus heals the ten lepers, and one of them comes back and thanks him, and the rest don't. Um, and, and, you know, we know the story. It's kind of, it's kind of an interesting story, but I, I just want to deal with leprosy for a minute. So, first off, leprosy uh, in Jesus' time was not something that was easily cured. Leprosy, most people that had leprosy in Jesus' time were, were kicked out of, of the city where they lived, and they were told to live outside the city, and they were to be uh, isolated from people, and they weren't allowed to uh, be in contact with anyone. And, and so there actually were colonies of lepers that would, would develop outside these cities because they weren't allowed in the city. And uh, leprosy is a horrible disease. It's a skin disease that actually consumes your body. What happens is it kills off the nerve endings, and then you don't know you've cu cut yourself or hurt yourself, and eventually what happens is that gets infected, and then eventually you start losing limbs and parts of your body. It's not a wonderful disease. Now, that's probably a pretty general explanation of leprosy. It's probably more complex than that. But understand that, that in our day and age, leprosy, there is a cure. We actually have ways to cure leprosy. Uh, and, and leprosy is still around, but, but there, is, there is ways to cure leprosy. But in Jesus' time, there wasn't. And so much so that in the book of Leviticus, there's actually two chapters in Leviticus that are like 60 or 70, 60 verses long that deal with the issue of unclean skin and what you're required to do if you had a skin disorder. So you would have to go to the priest and the priest would have to say whether you were clean or not. And if this priest decided that your skin condition that you had was not clean, he would tell you that you had to go out and be gone for seven days, and you could come back after seven days and be checked again by the priest, but the priest was the one that did it, partially because there wasn't a lot of doctors kicking around. But the priest was the one that would decide. And so if you had leprosy, the priest would literally tell you to leave and not come back. And the only way you could come back was if you were cured, and if you were, you still had to go to the priest to be considered clean. If you had leprosy, you were to cover your face, you were to stay outside the city, and anyone came near you, you were to shout, unclean, unclean, stay away. Now, can you imagine? Kind of sounds like COVID. Not really. But, I mean, think about it. I mean, it was a horrible disease. It's still a horrible disease. It's not a disease anyone would want. And yet... There were people in Jesus' time that had it. You know, when we think of Thanksgiving, we think of, oh, it's a great time for family and friends, and we come together and we celebrate, and we, you know, maybe we're, we're, we're more conscientious about being thankful for our lives and what we have. But you know what we should be thankful every day? Not just on Thanksgiving weekend. Every day. So let's look into the scriptures uh, in Luke chapter 17 is where this story is found. And it says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Master, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourself to the priest. 
And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? When he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now, this story is, you know, it's kind of easy to, to understand. You know, there were ten lepers. They had, they had leprosy. They came and asked Jesus to heal them. And Jesus told them to go to the priest. And on their way to the priest, they're cleansed and healed from their leprosy. Now, have you ever really read a, a story in Scripture and thought, there's got to be more to the story? Like, this particular story, there's only eight verses here. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's this long, drawn-out story and, and, and God explains everything that was going on. But just picture for a moment, how did these guys that were hanging outside the town know that this was Jesus? Have you ever thought about that? How did they know it was Jesus? It's not like they had Facebook and, you know, they could go to Jesus' profile and go, oh, there's Jesus, that's what he looks like when we see him. No, they didn't have that. They didn't have a newspaper going around with Jesus' picture in it. They, all they heard was probably the story that happened in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus healed the leper and he touched him. And I'm sure that when Jesus healed that leper, that story got around to every leper colony in the, in the, in the 100 kilometer area probably because just somebody was healed from leprosy. And so... They're looking for Jesus. They're, they're hoping that Jesus is going to come that way. It's not like the disciples, you know, were wearing shirts that said, Team Jesus. Right? It's not like, it's not like the, it was obvious. There's Jesus with his 12 disciples. It's not like they were wearing shirts that said, Hey, we're, we're Jesus' team. Uh, we're here to heal you. No, they didn't know who Jesus was all they had heard about was his ability to heal. You see, these guys were desperate. I mean, have you ever been so desperate that you would call out to everyone that walked by, Master, Jesus, just hoping it was him? I mean, think about it. They cry out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. How did they know it was Him? Who told them? Because anyone that knew Jesus wasn't allowed to go near them. Think about it. Anyone hanging out with Jesus wasn't allowed to go over to the leper colony and say, hey, by the way, uh, you know, Jesus is coming. Uh, better you line up. Get ready. It's not like Jesus sent the disciples ahead of him and go, hey, go get the lepers and have them all line up on the side of the road and we'll, we'll take care of them when we go by. No, it, it's not like that. Maybe they called out to everyone that came by hoping that Jesus was going to be one of them. Maybe everybody that walked by, they hollered out, Jesus! Master, have pity on us! And if the person walked by and never responded, maybe they thought, well, I guess that's not Jesus. You know? Next person comes by, Jesus! Have pity on us! Can you imagine? I can just imagine, though, because Jesus was not an uncommon name. It was a common name. There were actually other people called Jesus, not just Jesus, okay? So can you imagine? There's this guy who's, whose name is Jesus. And, and he's, you know... He keeps getting people coming up to him. Hey, are you the Jesus that healed the leper? Are, are you the Jesus that healed the blind guy? Hey, are you the Jesus that, that turned water into wine? And, you know, he's coming through by himself. He's walking down the road. And all of a sudden, these ten lepers come out. Jesus! Have pity on us! I mean, he's hightailing it the other way. He's not sticking around, even if his name's Jesus. But they cry out. Master, Jesus, have pity on us. You know, it always amazes me when we read Scripture, we, we kind of get this idea of this is how Jesus does things. 
You know, well, when Jesus healed the blind person, he spit on the ground, he mixed up some mud, he put it on their face, and they were healed. Um, right? He did do that, right? Do you know that he, didn't, he only healed one person that way, as far as we know, in Scripture? The other one, he spit in his face. That one's good. Another one he touched. And another one, he just said, you're healed. And so these, these guys who are looking to be healed from leprosy are hanging out near the edge of town, hoping that Jesus is going to come by that way. And when they, when they cry out, Master, have pity on us, Jesus gives them an instruction. Look at what he says. He says, go, show yourself to the priest. Now, if I was one of these lepers, and I'd heard the story about Jesus healing the other leper, I'd be like, uh, Jesus, um, you know, that guy over there that you healed from leprosy, uh, you touched him. Are you going to touch me? Because I know you touched him and he was healed, so are you going to touch me? And Jesus like, there's no... There's no, it just says, go, show yourself to the priest. Think about this. They're not healed. They're standing there with leprosy, probably missing some body parts. And, and they're like, you know, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, oh, go, go see the priest. This is not really the, the words they want to hear. They want to hear the words, you're healed. They want to hear Jesus you know, they want to see Jesus touch them. They want, they want the miraculous right there and then from Him. And He says, oh, go to the priest. Go see the priest. Now picture this. Going to the priest with leprosy, if you're not healed, is not a good thing. Because the, the priest is going to kick you out and tell you not to come back. But, but He says to them, go, show yourself. Picture the scene. Jesus is there with his 12 disciples. They're all kind of hanging out together. Ten, ten lepers. And Jesus tells them to go. This is the only way back into society. Understand, the priest is the only one that can tell these lepers that they're allowed to be back in society. They're the only ones that can tell them that they're clean, is the priest. So Jesus says, go to the priest. Go to the one that can, can put you back into society. The one that has the approval. And again, it's not what happened in Mark. Then he touches the leper, right? In Mark, he touches the leper, but here he doesn't. Just think about it. What's amazing is that they don't question Jesus. It's not like there's a, a discussion about how to heal them. They don't question Jesus. They literally go. They, they literally do what Jesus said. The, the rest of the verse says, as, as they went, they were cleansed. Now, can you imagine? They're walking down the road. Right? They, they, Jesus says go. So they, they turn and they start to go. And as they're walking, one of them goes, hey, Something's happening. That feels a little different. And they walk a little bit further, and all of a sudden, one of them's like, whoa. And they get a little bit further, and, and one of them starts taking the bandages off, going, my finger's there. It's been gone. I mean, there's a change that's happening to them as they go. They are being cleansed as they're walking towards the priest. They haven't got there yet. But you can imagine as they start to go and things start to change, they start getting excited to the point where they're almost running to the priest. They're almost running. They're, they're so excited about what's happening. You see, anytime God is going to do something in our lives, it usually requires obedience on our part. You know, a lot of times we're, we're, we're quick to go, well, God, you know, you said this, but we're not obedient to what he said. 
Now, I, I just think about this for a moment. Anytime God's blessing comes, it's usually because of obedience on our part. Now, it's not that, that God won't bless you if you're not obedient, but He's looking for obedience. He's looking for us to walk with Him. He's looking for us to do what He's called us to do. And out of that comes the blessing of the Lord. Now, if you don't think so, look in Scripture. God tells Noah to build a boat. Right? He says, go build an ark. He's like, what's an ark? Go build an ark. I'll tell you how to build it. I'll tell you how big to build it. He spends a hundred and, I think it's 120 years building the boat. Can you imagine? He's just being obedient. It hasn't rained a drop. For 120 years, he's just being obedient to God. And, and, and there's no blessing. He's getting ridiculed by his neighbors. His children are probably frustrated with him. He's got all this stuff going on. You know, who knows? Maybe the building inspector was coming around going, what are you doing? Why are you building this here? Like, you don't have rights to build here. You know, you only have so much land. I don't know what was going on, but he's dealing with this thing. And there's no blessing in it. He's just being obedient to what God says. And what happens? God brings the rain. And he's saved from the disaster. Him and his family. How about Joseph? Spends 13 years running. Or not running, but 13 years. He's sold as a slave by his brothers who they hate him. They want to kill him. He's sold into slavery. He goes down and he's sold to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife lies about him. He goes to jail because of it. While he's in jail, he meets the cup, cup uh, bearer and the, and the baker of the, of the king. And, he, and they have a dream. He tells them their, their dream, and they forget about him. I mean, 13 years go by. Do you understand? Sometimes being obedient will take time. The blessing may not be instantaneous. For these ten it was, but for some of us, sometimes we need to just be obedient even in the midst of what seems difficult. Out of the obedience of Israel, God blessed the Israelites and took them out of Egypt. You know, through the history of their journey through the wilderness, there were times where they were not obedient. But when they were, there was always blessing. You don't think so? Go into Scripture. God gave them water in the desert. He gave them manna. He gave them quail. He took care of them the entire time that they were in the wilderness. Just think about this. Water to wine. The first miracle Jesus does, right? You know, there's Jesus. He's sitting at the wedding. And they run out of the, of the wine, the good wine. And so, so, you know, somebody goes to his mom and says, Hey, like, you know, you think Jesus could, could, like, fix this? I don't know what Jesus did as a teenager, but his mother thought he could fix this. Like, think about it. He's a carpenter. He's not, like, he's not a guy who makes wine. And yet, his mother thinks Jesus can deal with this. So you, can you imagine as a teenager what Jesus must have done? I mean, this is the only miracle, this is the very first miracle that we find in Scripture, but I think Jesus probably did some things when he was a kid, as a teenager or something, because how would his mother even think to, to suggest that Jesus could fix this problem? And Jesus says, go fill up the pot with water. Now, how many know that wine and water are two different things? I mean, I don't even think they put water in wine. I could be mistaken because I've never made wine and I don't know how they make it. I, I assume it's just grape juice that is fermented. But I could be mistaken. But hear me. Jesus tells them to fill up the pots with water. I mean, this is crazy. You know, like, like I can just imagine that, you know, the waiter, you know, fill it up with water? Like, really? Water? Like, like water. What's, what good is water? But they're obedient. They do it. They fill it up. Can you imagine the look on their face when they went to pour out that water that they put in and they pour it out and it's wine? Like, they're probably freaking out. 
their obedience brought blessing even though they didn't realize it was coming. See, obedience is always required. It will always bring blessing. So, these ten, ten guys are obedient to what Jesus says. He says, go to the priest. Go see the priest. Right? Go show yourself to the priest. So they do. They, they get up. They leave. They, they go walking towards the priest. And as they're going, they're being healed. You know, God is not up in heaven sitting there with a big bucket going, okay, somebody needs a blessing. Let's throw it out. God is looking for us to walk in obedience with Him. And always, always, there is something required of us in the midst of it. And you may say, well, you know, God blesses people, you know, without, without obedience. That's true. There are times that people get blessed even though they, they're not obedient to God. But here's the thing. It will always require something of us. It will always require something. It, it, it may be simple. It may just be the willingness to receive what he has. It may require us to go somewhere and do something. But it doesn't just happen. It, it does involve us. It will require some involvement on our part. You see, Jesus said to them, right? Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, this is where we get into the part of the story that's really about Thanksgiving. Now, you may say, well, we know the story, right? The, the Samaritan came back, and, and, Jesus, you know, and, and he thanked Jesus, and then Jesus made a big deal. So let's just look at the Scripture. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, I don't know how much you know about Samaritans, but Samaritans were not people that Jewish people would hang out with. Samaritans were not people that, that the Jews liked. They were actually so racist towards Samaritans that, that they would literally walk on the other side of the, the road away from them. You know, when Jesus talks about the Good Samaritan, the, the Jewish people not wanting to deal with the guy in the ditch, but the Samaritan does. The reason Jesus talks about the Samaritan is because the Samaritan did what the Jews would not do. They would literally avoid somebody who was injured or hurt, and especially if they were Samaritan. They would not go near them. They saw the Samaritans as the worst people in the world. They were worse than the Gentiles. Because they were Jewish people who had cross-mingled with Gentiles and, and they ended up having, you know, marrying Gentiles. And because of that, the Samaritans were part Jewish, but they weren't fully Jewish. And so the Jews of that time were so racist towards Samaritans that if they knew you were a Samaritan, they would not talk to you. They would avoid you at all costs. <clears throat> And yet, it's a Samaritan that comes back to Jesus. Now, there's lots of speculation of why, but let me just carry on for a moment. Jesus asked the question, right? Jesus asked the question, were not all ten cleansed? Now, is this a question that Jesus knows the answer to? Right? Jesus knows that all ten were cleansed. He knows what he did. He knows what has happened. He knows that all ten were cleansed. He's not asking the Samaritan a question he doesn't know the answer to. He's asking the Samaritan to say it out loud. Why? Because he wants the disciples to hear what's going on. He says, we're not all ten cleansed. Right? Where are the other nine? Where are they? And, and you know, I mean, the disciples are sitting there watching this thing unfold. I can imagine the disciples are like, oh, Lord, not again. We've got a problem. Jesus is going to go after the Samaritan. 
He's going to tell us how they're great, and we don't like them. We really have to listen to this Jesus. I mean, he is a Samaritan. Right? Jesus, Jesus is about to tell his disciples, hey, by the way, look who came back and begged me. Look who came back. Where are the other nine? Now, we don't know if the other nine were Samaritans too. We assume they're not. We assume that they were Jews because Jesus makes a point of referencing to the fact that this is the only one that came back, the foreigner. Now, picture this. Not only is that an interesting statement, but the fact that the Samaritan was hanging out with nine Jewish guys. You know why? Because they were just as unclean as the Samaritan. They weren't allowed to even be in town as well. They were considered outcasts because of their disease. And so the Samaritan, you know, he's grateful because not only is he healed, but a Jewish rabbi paid attention to him. You see, I'm sure Jesus knew where the rest were. He, all re- he knew that the rest were, were not coming. He knew, right? Jesus knew everything. He knew that they were clean, and he knew that they weren't coming back. But he asked the Samaritan, where are the other nine? Where are they? Hey, the moment they got clean, guess what? They deserted the Samaritan. Because they don't want to be seen with the Samaritan, because if they're seen with the Samaritan, they're unclean anyways. That's how bad it was. And so... He's left alone. You know, Jesus throws out the race card. Oh, look at what he says. He says, Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Like, oh, by the way, the only one that came back is the one who isn't Jewish. The only one that came back to thank me is the one that isn't Jewish. Now, maybe there's a reason for that. Right? The Samaritan, I mean, they were traveling between Samaria and Galilee. So maybe the Samaritan, it was a little bit further for him to go home before he went home. He went down to the, the neighbor, that town to have the priest say he was clean before he went home. I don't know. But what we do know is that the Jewish guys never came back. They never came back to thank Jesus. They never came back, and and Jesus makes a point to his disciples, hey, why is it that the only one that came back was the foreigner? You see, he's the only one that wouldn't have been welcomed by the Jews. He's the only one that, that wouldn't have been, you know, he would be the only one that that wouldn't have been welcomed. You see, the Samaritan was a big problem for the Jewish people. You know what Jesus says to them after this happens? After he says this, you know, he, he makes sure that the disciples hear it. Hey, you know, the only one that returned was a foreigner. He says this to him. He says, then he says to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now let me ask you a question. When he came back to thank Jesus, was he already cleansed? He was, right? He wouldn't have come back to thank Jesus if he wasn't clean from leprosy. So what was Jesus saying? What was Jesus saying when he said, hey, your faith has made you well? Was he talking about the cleansing of leprosy or was there more to it? You see, here's the thing. As a Samaritan, their their religious bent was kind of like they were Jewish, but they added a bunch of other stuff. And Jesus is saying, look, your faith, your faith in me makes you well. You see, it's more than just a spiritual, it's more than just a physical thing that happened to him. He was also changed spiritually. He was, he was made well. He was made whole. There's a difference. Yeah, he received a physical healing from leprosy just like the other nine, but his faith actually went a little bit further. It brings a spiritual wellness to him. His faith made him able to come before Jesus. Think about this. As a Samaritan, he wasn't even allowed to talk to Jesus. He wasn't allowed to talk to him. He could actually be hurt just for talking to a Jewish person. 
And yet he comes to Jesus and he bows down before him and he says, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's a gratitude from him that is, that is not found in the others. Now, it's interesting because, you know, most times when we look at this story, you know, people like to, to point out that the Samaritan was the only one that was grateful. The rest weren't. I don't believe that's true. Let's be honest. If you had a disease that was literally debilitating, that would kill you, and you were healed from it, and you were walking through town, and, and somebody saw you and said, Hey, Benny, what's going on, man? You look pretty good. What happened? Well, let me tell you. You think they would have kept that a quiet? That they would, I mean, they're allowed back in town. You see, there's, there's some things about gratitude that I want us to consider. First and foremost, gratitude will always require a decision with an action. You know, you, you can say, well, I'm thankful, but are you really thankful? You see, there's a requirement to gratitude. It's not just simply mouthing it. It's actual showing action. What did the, the Samaritan do? He came back to Jesus. The others went home. Now, gratitude is not something that we naturally um, do. You may say, well, I'm very thankful, Pastor Mark. I, I, you know what? I bet you as a child you weren't. How many of you parents have ever said this? When somebody has done something nice to your child or given them a compliment, it happened this morning, right, patients? Uh, right? Because I, I said to uh, Ileana, I said, Oh, you look so beautiful today. And I heard patients say, now say thank you. Right? That happened. Why? Because it's not naturally comes out of us. It's something that we're taught to do. We're taught. We, we teach our children to be thankful. We teach our children to, to thank somebody for, for being kind to them or, or, or giving them something or, or treating them well. We say, you know, now what do you say? What do you say? I, I know I said it. You know, to our kids. Now, if, if, you, if you hear that enough as a child, eventually you become a, a thankful person and, and you recognize that when somebody does something for you, you thank them. And you know, we do live in a country that's pretty thankful. Most people, anyways, in, in Canada tend to be fairly polite and they, they're thankful and, and, you know, sometimes. You see... To be thankful requires an action. It's not just simply lip service. Paul had to teach the Philippian church to be thankful. Philippians 4, 4 through 9, it says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. And the peace of God which trans all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Paul was teaching the Philippian church that they needed to be thankful. They needed to be thankful in their petitions to the Lord. They weren't, you know, just go, go God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. We say, no, be thankful. Be thankful for what the Lord has done. Be thankful that the Lord has saved you. Be thankful that the Lord has put something in your life. Be thankful that God is working in your, in your day to day. Now, you know, I've said this, you know, that all of them probably were thankful, right? You see, I find it hard to believe that anyone that has gone through that could possibly get healed and not be thankful. But you see, God's not looking for just a decision to be thankful. He's looking for our action to actually go to Him and say, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done. I'm pretty sure that anyone that met them knew that they, that they were thankful that they were healed. There's no way that you could have leprosy and be kicked out of town and, and had to live in a colony where you had to wear torn clothes and, and cover your face. And, you know, I mean, the, the instructions in Leviticus are pretty ri ri ridiculous. They literally were to wear torn clothes. So that people knew they had leprosy. 
They were told to wear torn clothes and to keep their face covered because they didn't want anybody to see how gross they, their face had become because of leprosy. And, and, and so there, were, there was a required action on their part. And yet, they did nothing. The one came back. The other thing that, that gratitude always will bring is humility. Think about this. Humility is, is, is really an act of gratitude. You know, you will, never, you will never be thankful for what you have if you are prideful. Because you will always be thinking it was because of you. It will always be caught up about, well, you know, I, 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 they did that because I'm, I'm such a great guy. You know, Jesus healed me because, you know, I am Jewish. Where do we find the Samaritan? We find him on his, on his face before Jesus, at his, at his feet. We find him coming humbly before the Master and saying to him, you know, thank you. You see, gratitude will always bring humility. And humility will always bring gratitude. If you're humble, you're going to be thankful for everything that you get. And if you're, if you're thankful, you're probably going to be humble because you realize that it wasn't because of you. Now, this next passage of Scripture I'm going to read out of Deuteronomy, it's, it's a passage of Scripture that, that God is, is dealing with the nation of Israel. And, and it's, it's quite fitting for uh, the world we live in today. Because God is, is telling them that they're not grateful. He's saying, hey, you need to be grateful. Listen to what it says. When you have eaten and are satisfied, in verse 10, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. So he's talking about being obedient, right? He's telling them, don't forget the laws, don't forget the decrees, be obedient. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery, he led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and wetless, well, waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors have never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. This is, what, this is what Moses is saying to the Israelites. Can you imagine? You know, they've, they've come through this thing, and he's telling them, listen, you need to get, get it straight. God's the one that's done all this. Don't be proud. Don't, don't allow yourself to be so caught up. To test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hand has produced this wealth for me. That's a world we live in today, folks. Everybody's talking about them. You don't believe me? Just go on Facebook. Why do we have so many social media apps? Why are people consumed by them? Why are people constantly on a media app, some, some media app posting something about themselves? Why? Because we're consumed by, our, by this this selfish attitude of, of, it's all about me. Look at what I've done. But he says this, but remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gave you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your ancestors as it is today. 
It's so easy for us to get caught up in what we've done and how good we are and how talented we are and what, what our strengths are and, and look at what I can do and look at this and look at that. But everything that you have, every ability you have, every talent you have, everything that you've ever done, God gave you the ability to do those things. And we need to be thankful to the one that created us and made us uniquely different than the person sitting next to you. You see, every one of us is different. And sometimes we, we you know, I, I, I've done this where I've looked at somebody who I know and I've gone, oh, you know, I can't believe they're, I mean, like, like, you know, they're doing that. When I started in ministry, I have a very good friend. His name is Rich James. Rich James and I, when we uh, started in ministry, we were both assistant youth pastors. He was in Bowmanville and I was in Ajax. We were the assistant youth pastors, so we were the assistant to the youth pastor. We weren't the youth pastor yet, we were just the assistant. And, and you know, him and I had lots of conversations about that relationship of being the assistant. And we've been friends all these years. And, and there was a moment while I was in Gravenhurst when, when things were just really going hard and difficult. And, and I was thinking like, you know, God, like, why am I here? What, what's the point? And da, 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 da. And my friend Rich James was appointed the president of, of Master's Bible College. My other friend, Jeff, who was working at the district, was appointed to a church. He, he went to be the pastor of a church in in Orleans, outside of Ottawa, a church of about 700. And there I was, sitting in Gravenhurst, with debt that we couldn't pay, a building that was a mess, and 30 people. Saying, God, like, really? I started having a pity party for myself. And God got on my case and told me, you need to be thankful for your brother's. So I had to pick up the phone and call my friend Rich and say, Rich, I don't know anybody better than you to run Bible college. I remember making that call and thinking how hard it was because I was so bummed out with where I was and what was going on. And I remember making the phone call and when, when I was done having my conversation with, with him, I got off the phone and I felt better. So then I picked up the phone and called my friend Jeff in Ottawa, and I said, Jeff, I, I just want to tell you I'm so excited about what you're doing, and, and thank you for being my friend. And I realized something during, the, the, during that time, that, that it didn't matter what I was doing, it was all about my attitude and my heart. Rich is still the pastor or still the president of the Bible College. Jeff is still the pastor in, New, in Orleans. And both of them are doing well. And guess what? I'm the pastor here. And I am thankful for what God has brought me through. I've told you this before. It is a joy to pastor here in Sioux Lookout. It's a joy to pastor this church. And it really is. And, and I'm not, you know, I, I don't say all that, to, but, but it's so easy for us to get focused in on ourselves instead of what God's doing. And, and, you know, we, we can quickly look at the situation and think, oh, woe is me. And, and you know, and, and look at what I've done and I've accomplished. We, we can sit and pat ourselves on the back and think that we're doing great because we did something. And the truth is, it's all in the hands of Him. It's all in the hands of the Master. It's all in the hands of Jesus. And, and, and you know, when, the, when these guys came to Jesus and they said, you know, have pity on us, they recognized the only way that they were going to get healed was if Jesus healed them. They didn't have any other options. And if there's a passage that's in Scripture that our nation needs to hear, it's this passage in Deuteronomy where God says, hey, when you get to that place and you have all this stuff, remember where you got it. You know what? We have a, we have a, a, a culture that basically is caught up in stuff. You know, if I get this, I get that. And, 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 you know, our debt loads are crazy because of it. You see, 
being grateful and being, having an attitude of gratitude and being thankful will bring us to a place of humility because we will realize it's not about us, it's about who gave us all of that. The other thing that it will do is gratitude will always draw us closer to God. If you, if, if you don't think so, start being thankful. Start, start thanking God for the things he's done, and you will find that you will be drawn closer to him because you're recognizing his authority and who he is. Look at, look at the story. There's 10 of them, right? There's 10 of them. And they had to stay away from everyone. And the moment they realized it was Jesus, what did they do? They ran. They're like, Jesus! And, and it's, so, it's so amazing that after they get healed, the Samaritan not only comes to Jesus, but he doesn't hold anything back. He's literally at his feet. He comes as close as he can get to Jesus. I, I would imagine he probably wanted to hug him. You know, maybe he did. Maybe he wrapped his arms around Jesus' legs and his feet and just, you know, wept before Jesus. I don't know. It, it doesn't really tell us other than he, he, he was before Jesus' feet. When we come to that place of having gratitude and recognizing what God does, it will always bring us to a closer walk with him. Have you ever noticed that when we're, when we're not thankful, we're always looking at what we don't have? We want this or we want that. We want, you know. We're, when we're not thankful, we're always thinking about what, what's the next thing that I need. And yet when we're thankful, we, we don't even think about the things that we need. We're so thankful for what God's done. Romans 1, 21. For although they knew God, they never glorified Him as God, nor gave him, thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. This chapter in Romans, uh, Paul is saying, saying to the Roman church, he says, you know, these people that he's referring to is a group of people who had stopped being grateful. They stopped being thankful about anything. And, and it says that because of their action of not being thankful, God turned them over. In the next few verses, it actually says that God turned them over to their sinful ways. Folks, I don't know about you, but I don't want God turning me over to my sinful ways because I'm not thankful. You see, if we're thankful, it will draw us close to Him. If we're not, it will push us further away. And lastly... Gratitude is God's will for your life. If you don't believe me, I'm going to show you that it is. You see, God's desire for you, His will for your life, you know, people say that, oh, I, I just want to know what God's will is. Well, first and foremost, His will for your life is to be thankful. Look at what 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, rejoice always. First of all, you, you, you're to rejoice always, no matter what the circumstance. Don't, don't be so, so consumed by the circumstances that you have no way to rejoice in what God has done. It says rejoice always. Pray continually. Rejoice and pray. And then it says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. His will for you is to give thanks in all circumstances. Not just what's going on today, next week, but all circumstances. It's God's will for you to be thankful. You know, maybe we were praying for lots of things, a job, a relationship, finances, schooling. Some of you are praying for things that the Bible doesn't say anything about, and you don't know whether it's in God's will or not. You're not sure what God's will is. But I do know this, he's called us to be thankful. It's easy. You know, we hear it all the time. People are like, I want to know what God's will is. 
And sometimes we think God's will is going to be some hard, difficult thing, or it's going to be this amazing plan that God has. And, and truthfully, why don't you just start right there with just being thankful? You want the heart of God? Be thankful. Have a heart of gratitude. I guarantee that if you become a person that is, grat- that is thankful and has gratitude, guess what will happen? Your life will change. Your life will change. How many are thankful that you haven't died yet? Well, there's something to be thankful for. How many are thankful you're in church today? How many are thankful you're not in the hospital today? You see, when we, when we start to become thankful, it will radically change our lives. Because we'll take the focus off the things that we don't like, and it'll put the focus back on the things that it should be on, and that is what God has done. What are the things that are ruling your life? Or are you ruling your life? Is your life ruling you or are you ruling it? Like, like if, if, if your life is ruling all the decisions you make because you're frustrated and, and, and fearful and doubtful and, and, and not thankful, guess what? Your life is going to be a mess. And you may say, well, you know, Pastor Mark, gratitude, yeah, it's great for you to say that. Well, here's the thing. Um, it's not something that's new. God's been telling people for centuries to have a heart of gratitude. And it's interesting, so just bear with me, I'm going to pull up something here. Um, If you do a Google search on gratitude, you know what happens when you do a search on gratitude? You find like literally hundreds, if not thousands of articles and web pages that say things like this. Why is gratitude important? The benefits of gratitude. Five ways to practice gratitude in your daily life. The benefits of of gratitude boost the immune system. Did you know that? Being thankful will actually boost your immune system. There's articles, the benefit of gratitude and how to start, get started. Seven scientific proven benefits of gratitude that will motivate you to give thanks year-round. Now you may say, well, Pastor, I mean, where does that come from? That came from Forbes magazine. Forbes magazine. A magazine talking to people about their investments and money, and, and, and they're telling people, hey, you want to be successful? You want to, have, you want to do, be, be a person of gratitude? That's crazy, folks. Here's one, 28 benefits of gratitude and the most significant research finds from from the Psychology Magazine. So, So folks, God is not the only one that has said this, but God is the one that authored it. Understand, you know, being a person of gratitude actually has health benefits, social benefits, physical benefits, mental health benefits. You want you want to you know improve your mental health? Just start being thankful. Like I, I put this up. These are just ten simple ones. It reduces so it reduces depression. Being thankful reduces depression. Strengthens resilience. Less chronic pain for people that are thankful. Now, I'm not saying that, that these are all the answers to your problems. Folks, we have, people are sick and, and they have chronic pain. But, but what they're saying is that having this attitude of, of gratitude, this, this, this overwhelming attitude of thankfulness, actually will improve your health. I mean, increases self-esteem. More likely to help others when you're thankful. That's interesting, isn't it? Improves sleep. 
retains more positive experiences, increases energy levels, reduces feeling of jealousy, and improves physical health. Now, that's just 10. Obviously, there's lots of things that it probably does. But it's interesting because all of these things go back to this one thing. God has called us to be this way. God knows how He made you. God knows how he, he put you together. He knows how he, he formed you. He knows everything about you. He knows what your mental capacity is. He knows what your physical capacity is. He knows what your social capacity is. God knows everything there is about you. And he says, hey, by the way, one of the things you should do is be thankful. And it's not, it's not a, a be thankful because you're a nice guy or a nice woman. He's saying be thankful because it will help you. And it's a, it's, a, it's a thing to all of us. doesn't matter what your mental state is. doesn't matter how socially you are. doesn't matter how physically fit you are or unfit you are. It doesn't matter how, how you know, much money you have or how little money you have. It doesn't matter if you live in a big house or a small house. It doesn't matter if you, you know, you're red, white, black, blue, purple. It doesn't matter your color of your skin or your economic status. It doesn't matter about anything other than God says be thankful and if you are, God will bless you. And you may say, well, is that the only reason to be thankful? No! We need to be thankful even if God doesn't bless us. I mean, think about it. Think of what all the things that God has already done. You know, when you think of your spouse or you think of, 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 of your friend or your, or your family, are you thankful? What's the words that come out of your mouth? Are you thankful or you, or you criticize or condemn or, or be frustrated? Or... And look, we've all done it. We've all said things and, and done things we shouldn't have done or said to somebody that we loved. God says, are you thankful? Are you thankful? Tessa and, and Em, if you could come, please. And help me. Tessa and Emily are going to come and give you this piece of paper. And I know I'm probably breaking all the rules, but just bear with me. If you guys want to just take those and make sure everybody has one, and then also take the pens, take some pens, and if they need a pen, you can give them a pen. It's pretty simple. It's a piece of paper with lines on it, and at the top it says 15 things I'm thankful for. And this is just a, this is a simple exercise I want you to do before you leave today. Now, it may sound, you know, ridiculous. Oh, pastor, please. But I want you to just take a moment to recognize that you have things to be thankful for. Now, maybe that thankfulness is, you know, that you turned on the, the lights this morning and they came on. Maybe it's the fact that when you went in and had a shower this morning, the water was hot. Maybe, like, but what are you thankful for? You see, if we would start to become people who are aware of our thankfulness, our lives would start to change. The more we're thankful, the more life is going to change. You know, it said that one of the things that, one of the benefits of, of thankfulness is that, of gratitude, is that you actually, um, you actually will help others. Do you know what I found? I, and I found this to be true. When you help other people, it does something for you. And you may say, well, no, no it, it helps them. No, it helps you. When you help other people, it actually makes you, a, makes you be more thankful for what you have. Now, have you ever, ever done something for somebody and they weren't very thankful? Even though it was a good thing for them? We've done that. We, we've helped people who weren't very thankful. And you, know, you kind of walk away and like, Really? Like, didn't you appreciate what I did? And they're like, well, uh, not really. Or, yeah, I appreciated it, but, you know, couldn't you have done a little more? 
Folks, we need to be so thankful when, when people minister to us and however they do and whatever they do. Let's become people that are thankful. Let's, let's, let's be the people that our sign outside says. Where, where our default setting is thankfulness, gratitude. Not, not complaining. I one time asked the youth in Edmonton if, if complaining was one of the fruit of the Spirit. And they looked at me, Pastor, I can't believe you'd say that. I said, well, you know what? You're supposed to be walking in the Spirit and all I ever hear from you is complaining. And they're like, well, it's not a fruit of the Spirit. I said, well, then get rid of it. Let us be people who are thankful. I would encourage you when you sit down with your families this weekend or your friends or whoever you're sitting with, I would encourage you at the dinner table that you would take a moment and have everyone sitting at the table just say what they're thankful for. It may seem like, like it seems so simple and yet it's always amazed me how people struggle to be thankful. We've, we've done that the last couple years at our dinner table and Thanksgiving. I, I've said, well, before we leave the table, you know, whoever's sitting here, would you just express to us something you're thankful for? You know, and, and obviously the cop-out answer is, oh, I'm thankful for everything. If you're going to be sitting at our table this Thanksgiving, that's not the answer to use, okay? Just telling you. What are you thankful for? Take the time this weekend to just express that to each other. You need to know as your pastor, I am so thankful that God brought us to see Luca. I'm thankful to be the pastor of this church. I'm thankful to be part of this family I'm thankful for what God is doing in our lives and, and I'm thankful that, that, that you know God has brought us to this place where we're at I'm a little greedy I'll be honest I'm a little greedy I want more I want more of God I want more people I want more of our town saved I want more I, I, there are things I'm greedy about but I'm also very thankful for what God has done. We're going to pray and then uh, we're going to sing one song before we go. But would you pray with me today? Would you just lift up your heart to the Lord? Would you open your mouths and pray and just be thankful today? Heavenly Father, Lord, may we be like the Samaritan who came back and thanked you. Lord, you've done so many things in our lives and we take it for granted sometimes just what you do. Lord, may, may we not take for granted your work in our lives. May we not take for granted the things that you've done. May we not, may, may we not look at our lives and go, yeah, well, that's what God's supposed to do. Lord, may we not be like those Jews who didn't come back Lord, may we be like the Samaritan who comes to your feet and says, Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for saving me. Lord, thank you for pouring into my life. Lord, thank you for the friends and the people you put in my life to, to keep me straight and walk right. And Lord, thank you for the, the spouse that you've given me. And Lord, thank you for the children that you've given me. Lord, thank you. Thank you. 
May we be people that are thankful. May we be people with the heart of gratitude. Lord, may we be thankful for all that you do. May you not have to speak to us the way you spoke to the Israelites and told them, be thankful. May, may, you not, may, may you not have to turn us over to our sin because of our unthankfulness. Lord, may we be worthy of obedience to you, to your word. And Lord, may we walk before you in thankfulness. Lord, may the Spirit, may the fruit of the Spirit be evident in our lives. Lord, as you are faithful, may we be faithful to being thankful for the things that you've done. Lord, we give you honor, glory, and praise for you, Lord. Lord, as we gather in our homes and around tables, Lord, to celebrate Thanksgiving, May we be reminded once again, just, Lord, of what you've done. Lord, not not what we've done, but what you've done. Lord, the things that you've done in our lives. May we be thankful for the people sitting around our table. May May we be thankful for that person that, Lord, maybe just rubs us the wrong way sometimes. Lord, may our attitude of gratitude change how we see other people. May it cause us to be more like you. May it cause us to be more like you. Lord, let this weekend be a a, a time of celebration of the goodness of you. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name.